Hi folks, this video is about Common Lisp's loop macro. And the loop macro is one of the strange areas of Common Lisp. It is in itself a mini language for making all kinds of loops, but it has received some criticism, um, mainly stemming around the fact that people say it's not very lispy. And they're right. It doesn't follow the usual rules of evaluation that we're used to, and we'll see sometimes the syntax that's used is found nowhere else in the language. The other negative is that it's not extensible. So unlike some other macro systems that you may have seen, like the setf macro, you can't make loop understand your own functions or data types. So given these problems, why learn this bizarre and unextensible beastie? What has it got going for it? Well, first off, it's in the spec. And this may seem like a weird reason at first, but it does mean that if you're on any proper common list implementation, you already know how to throw together a wide variety of different kinds of loops. Your code's portable, and if you're making your code as, say, a library, um, then you're not forcing your users to have yet another dependency in their project. Also, you might rightly wonder why, after you've spent so much time and effort getting into recursion and learning how that works, why would you mess around with a different syntax for an iterative loop style? Well, as programmers, we're often making choices, not just based on the functionality of the code, but also on the readability and elegance of the code. There are occasions, we will look at a couple in a few minutes, where the iterative version may actually be more obvious, readable, and possibly elegant than the recursive solution. Also, when it comes time to optimize out code, you might find that an iterative approach is sometimes more efficient. So rather than dwell on this theory anymore, let's get into some examples. And I am just going to stick to straight up examples of different use cases rather than try and explain all the ins and outs of the language. I'm going to throw a couple of links in the description below, which will have much richer and fuller examples of what's going on and explanations of this mini language itself. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the examples on the left hand side, run them in the REPL and see what results we get. Now, immediately when we look at this, we see this is not usual Lisp code. We have loop, which is the name of the macro, which is fairly normal. But after that, no parentheses until the final closing paren. And we have all these strange clauses for, below, collect, which are completely alien to how we're normally used to styling our code. One of the things that I tend to do is that you are allowed to prefix all of these clauses with colons, which make them look and get syntax highlighted as keywords. Now this doesn't actually change the behavior at all, but what it does do is if you look over here, you can see immediately what parts are the clauses for the loop macro and what parts are what we kind of think of as regular Lisp code that we might already understand. Now, these counting loops can be very complicated. We can specify from what number we're going to count from, let's say, 1 below 5. We might say that we want to actually include 5 by saying up to 5. We might say we want to count down to a number, so down to maybe minus 15 from a given number. We can also specify how far we want to step with each increment, so we can say by 2. And see, each time here it's incrementing by 2. And this also obviously works in the positive direction. Oops, not if you do it like that. Up to. Okay. One thing I haven't explained is what collect is doing. This clause says evaluate the next form and then append whatever it evaluates to into a result list, which is finally returned when the loop has finished. The next example loops I want to go through are all to do with iterating over lists, because this is something we're going to be doing a lot. We're working with a list processing language. There's going to be a lot of lists. For that reason, I've set up a few example um, variables here. So we've got numbers, which stores the integers from 1 to 10. R numbers, which is the reverse of numbers, so 10 down to 1. We've got some symbols here from A to E. We've got some pairs, which again, these are just sublists with various numbers of arguments. So two with pairs and three with triples. This is just some example data that we can use. And I'm going to go and compile them now to get them into our running image in our REPL. Oops, hit the wrong button there. Okay, so now let's iterate 
over one of these lists. So rather than saying up to, down from, we can use in. So we can say for i in numbers, and each iteration I will be the following number in that list. So this will look very familiar from what we were doing before. But what's happening here is the first iteration, I will be one. The second, it'll be two, three, four, etc., etc. And this works just as well as with any data type. So we can say symbols, and there's our A to E we've iterated through there. So we could quite quickly make a um, little loop that will go and square all these numbers. So let's go square them. So we are, there's one to 10 squared. Now, this is one of these occasions where it might actually be more elegant to do things this way than the traditional way using something like map car. Even though the result is the same, what we're able to do here is read from left to right in a really simple fashion. Whereas in here, we have to look to the right to see what we're iterating over, and then we have this lambda here, which might not immediately indicate what's going on. Again, this is a matter of style and of preference, and there's a lot of things that Mapcar can do, and this lambda could be swapped out with, that is not equivalent in the loop macro. So it's however you want to write it. But in certain instances, this might be a case where this is what you want to do, and go with the loop macro. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the list of numbers and put them all in their own sublist. As you can see here, by collecting list i, we get individual sublists for each of these. Now in each iteration, we don't only have to be looping over one thing. So we can have for i in numbers and then for j in r numbers, and we're going to create little sublists with both of these. So each time it increments both of them. This is not a nested loop. This is a this is two lists being iterated over at the same time. So these are two separate variables, both with the contents of this list being incremented through them. Be aware that um, the loop macro will stop when either one list runs out of data. So in this case, we only get five numbers from the numbers list because there's only five symbols in the symbols list. And so it runs out of things to take from the symbols list and the loop terminates. As I mentioned before, collect is not the only clause we can use. And in this case, we're using do. What this will achieve is it will evaluate the form when it's right, just as collected, but not store the result. So this is very side effecty and not traditionally very lispy. Um, but there are occasions you do want to do this. There are always sections of your code which will be at least slightly imperative. And loop gives you the functionality to do these things easily. So here we are, we're just going to print out all of the numbers in the numbers list. Notice that the result is nil, not the last thing evaluated, because there is no return value in do. It just evaluates the form and then ignores whatever comes back. You can have multiple forms after a do statement, as we'll show here. As see, we went through each item in the numbers list, and we didn't actually do anything with that uh, number stored in the variable i. We just printed three things. Now we're going to look at nested loops, which are very simple as well. All you have to do is have one loop inside of another loop clause. In this case, we're using do to evaluate that second form. So as you can see here, we're looping for every number, we're then looping through every symbol in the symbols list, and printing i and j. Notice though again, I'll quickly run that again, nil is returned. These are do clauses that we're using, and so there are no results. You might think that if we wanted to return the results, we could do something like this. But again, this will return nil. Because even though we're collecting on this inner loop, do is not going to do anything with the result from this loop form. If you want to do this correctly, then you could use this. So both of these loop forms use collect. And you can see we've got a list full of sublists. Collect and do are not the only options, of course. We also might want to take all these sublists and actually append them together.
and we can do this using the append clause. As you can see here, now we get what we'd expect in this case. We append together all of the lists that have been returned by evaluating this loop form. We also are able to use conditionals, and this is one of the areas where the syntax just gets completely unlike any Lisp code you'll have had so far. Um, so we're looping for i in numbers, which is fair enough, and then we say if odd p, which is the predicate to say is this number odd, and then we collect i, which does what you would expect, but this syntax is very unusual. There are also else statements, which I recommend you have a look up. In fact, we'll show an example of one of those in a second. Rather than collecting, we can also sum, which is, as you can see, is just summing all of the odd numbers in this case. You can also use the into clause, which is rather unusual. It allows you to create another internal variable and store some of your results in that. This is very important. We're not using let here as we would normally, but we are creating an internal variable within this uh, loop form. When I evaluate this, though, we see we get nil because even though we're storing it in this internal variable, we're not doing anything with it. So what we'll have to do is, if I just copy this over, we have to say finally, which is a form evaluated once everything else is done, return A. And in that case, we get what we expect. These internal um, variables are actually very useful sometimes, so into can be very handy. In fact, one of the things you can do is collect into or append into uh, these variables. Let's do some more summing. This is a loop which will sum all of the even numbers into one variable and all the odd numbers into another and then return as a list both of the results. So you can hear, see here, if it's odd, then sum i into odds, else sum i into evens. This syntax is completely wrong for standard Lisp. And this is one of the areas where people would get very annoyed with the loop macro, understandably. So this is one of the areas where this syntax is very alien for Lisp programmers. And this has been attempted to be addressed in other macros uh, which handle iteration, like the iterate macro. So I'll put a link into the description below. It aims to fix the extensible problem and also the syntax problem, and it does a very good job of this. Of course, at this stage, you are then adding another dependency to your uh, code, but that might not be a problem. So again, if we evaluate this, oops, just press the wrong thing, evaluate this, we can see we've summed all the evens and odd numbers and returned them. We can make a very quick change to this, and rather than saying sum, we could collect. And here we'll get two sublists with the even and odd numbers stored in them. The REPL makes experimenting with these things very quick, so I personally find loop quite nice to use. We don't have to restrict ourselves just to iterating over lists, of course. We're also able to iterate over arrays or vectors. In this case, as you can see, we're just collecting into a list the numbers that are inside this vector. We can also do this with strings. So if I go in here and say, hello there, we can see that what is returned is a list of the characters that are being used in that string. We can also iterate over hash maps, and this is using the rather unwieldy being the hash keys of, which will, which will iterate over all the keys in a hash map, or being the hash values of, which is written like this, which will collect all of the values in a hash map. The for clause doesn't just have to be used for specifying iterating over something. So in this case, we're using another very unlispy bit of syntax, using this equals here to say, okay, for i in numbers, so for each iteration, i will be the next value in the numbers list. But then for s equals i squared, and then we're gonna sum s. Of course, this is just kind of a, a bogus example because we could just have done this and got the same result. But be aware you can use this for in different ways like this, which 
do occasionally have their uses and so it's one of the things I wanted to show. Finally, one of the great things that Loop can do is it has inbuilt the structuring. So if you have something like pairs, which we'll have a look at here, pairs, with all these sublists, and you wanted to have x to be equal to the first thing in the sublist and y to be equal to the second thing in the sublist, we just define it like this. So for, and then we have a list x, y in pairs. It will actually destructure the sublist and pairs into this. So let's start with something simpler than this, actually. We'll just say list x and y, and we get the same thing back. Oops, sorry about that. The example I had originally. And here we see we've actually just gone and made a new list where we've squared all of the um, numbers in the second position in the sublist. This also works even if you decide not to use all of the values in the sublist. So here we can say we just want to extract x and collect that. So it will happily just ignore the other values. Um, and we can see that this doesn't just work obviously with two items. We can destructure into as many as we like. And here again, we're using triples, but we're not using the z. So we're not using that third item in the sublists and everything's still working fine. Another thing we can do is we can take, let's take the example using Z, and put pairs here. Now pairs doesn't have enough values to satisfy this destructuring list, and so it will just default to nil for all of those values. This can be very handy when you have one loop um, that's destructuring across different kinds of lists with slightly different layouts. Finally, with destructuring, you might often want to use an equivalent to the at rest args kind of setup. Um, and in this case, we can use this rather unusual uh, cons form. So we can say loop for x, y, and triples. x is going to be the first item in the sublist. y is going to be all of the rest of them. And here we're just collecting a list. So as we can see, this is x, and this sublist is y. Okay, so this has been a real quick storm through the different kinds of loops um, that are provided by the loop macro. There are others. Uh, in the links below, I've also stuck a link to the periodic table of loop macro and its attempt to be able to visualize all these different combinations. There's also a link to practical common lists below on its, um, on its loop macro page, which is fantastic. And lastly, to the common list piper spec, which is very dense, but obviously very complete because it is the spec for the language. Um, that's all for now. Please do stick any comments or questions below. I know I went through this fairly quickly and I'm happy to expand on any questions you may have. Okay, have a good one. Bye.